stream the event on on YouTube. Very good. So we are now live streaming this uh, this event. Uh, hello, everyone. Welcome to all of you to a new webinar of the Spin-Off Competence Lab. Several of these sessions have already uh, taken place in the last few months uh, within a great variety of, of topics and, and themes. Uh, the Spin of Competence Lab, in a nutshell, intends to promote entrepreneurship and innov innovative ideas among our young researchers at the CU Alliance. Uh, it is organized in the framework of the Research U project, and the different webinars hosted in, within this initiative are available on our YouTube channel. Our topics uh, range from uh, from business models and lean startup to grant funding and equity finance going through different topics such as creative thinking or even this topic a speculative design and critical approaches towards uh, a speculative design it is our pleasure to have today with us Ivica Mitrovic from from the University of, of the split who already hosted a first webinar on the same topic on a speculative design and this which will be his second webinar on on the topic uh, we appreciate very much your your participation professor thank you very much for for being here with us and uh, to uh well without any further ado uh, we would like you to to take the floor and begin with uh, your presentation once again. Thank you very much for being here and and welcome again. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, uh, the first session was really like uh, uh, great, and we had also the really nice discussion during the presentation. And uh, I'm saying again hello from uh, from the split uh, from the Adriatic Coast City. And from the University of Split, uh, I will sh I will talk a little bit more about the city during the presentation because all our projects are situated in the local area, working with the local people, and uh, and and working in the local context. I will start with this uh, screen sharing now. And... No, it's coming, it's coming. <clears throat> okay. I hope you are uh, no. chance to see the slides. Okay. Uh, so, uh, uh, really, like a short uh, few words about me. I'm uh, working at uh, Arts Academy at the Department of Visual Communication Design for last uh, 25 years, and at the moment, I'm head of the uh, head of the department. Uh, and in this talk about, I will talk about uh, a specific approach in design which is called uh, speculative design and which is related to the technology, but not only on the technology, but also on the social, economical and the political context. And it's gonna be from my perspective, uh, from my experience for the, from the different projects I have been part in, in, in the past, and also as a kind of researcher and also in, as, as, a, as an educator. And, uh, this lecture is gonna be uh, gonna have like it's gonna is going to have like uh, three parts. Uh, the first dealing with the past, uh, with the chosen historical references. The second one dealing with the present. We selected case studies with employed uh, approaches, tools, and methods. And and the third one dealing with the future and the future past past of the practice not only on the speculative practice, but also on the design practice, on the future thinking uh, with the critical view of the speculative uh, practice. And let's start with the past. Well, ah, you'd be great, you and Ralph. I don't know if I could have a kid in a world like this. Oh, that's happy, thanks. Really though, it's, it is like that rook woman said. Things were okay a few years ago before 2008. Do you remember back then we used to think politics was boring? Those were the days. But now, I worry about everything. I don't know what to worry about first. Never mind the government. It's the sodding banks. They terrify me. And it's not even them. It's the companies, the brands, the corporations. 
They treat us like algorithms while they go around poisoning the air and the temperature and the brain and don't even start me on ISIS. Well, now we've got America. Never thought I'd be scared of America in a million years, but we've got fake news and false facts. And I don't even know what's true anymore. What sort of world are we in? Because <laughs> if it's this bad now, what's it going to be like for you? Huh? 30 years' time, 10 years, five years. What's it going to be like? And this is a short clip from the BBC serial Years and Years from, uh, I think, 2017 or 2018, which follows a turbulent 15 years in the future of one British family. And here, one of the main characters talks about uh, uh, how we have lost our faith in the future. Because the future uh, doesn't look anymore like this. Uh, this is something how my future in the in the 80s in the 1980s looks like the future was like really promising bright and it was really like uh, keen to see what the future will bring especially dealing with the technology but not, not only technology with new economical social and political context which gonna bring the future and with this process which uh, some of the uh, uh, theoreticians called the slow cancellation of the future, which started in the second part of the 20th century. Our future has been slowly colon colonialized by the dominant economic model. And sadly, we have lost our ability to imagine alternatives, what is possible, what is probable, and what is desirable. And design as uh, one of the drivers of the modernism, since its rapid growth during the last century, mostly played uncritical supporting role to the industry and to the application of technology. And with the globalization and new technologies, we are talking about like the beginning of, of this century with the uh, big data automatization, internet of things, uh, smart city, nano, nano or biotechnologies, uh, everything, uh, this, this like strong technology, technological achievements or development provided great possibilities in context of which design is becoming a kind of fundamental distinctive element of new products. And these new product services and systems uh, developed in such context had dramatical consequences on the society. Uh, we have this example of Uber, Uber, which in a short time have shocked economical, legal, and labor systems in many cities countries. And all this, like uh, uh, these examples here, are using design as a key element of, of, of economic and the market success. Unfortunately, design had its role in building of the so-called Anthropocene or capitalist in time, which more than ever in human history opens possibilities for extreme catastrophic scenarios. But on the other hand, we see around us a new design competition focusing on finding solutions for the biggest international problems. And this kind of, uh, uh, let's say trend maybe, brought back modernistic myths about this revolutionary role of design as a discipline that would change the world. And the number of design stars believe that new disasters create a new opportunities for designers. It looked that designers were, were the only ones capable of stopping this cycle of capitalism, ironically. But these projects or these design drive ideas or innovations, most of the time bringing approaches that intend to resolve the problems, they have been resulted from the technological development. And of course, with new innovations. And the most of the cases result, it results in design and production of another new technology. It's a kind of phenomena that we described as a Western melancholy. It's a process in which designer focus on the consequences of the current situations instead of dealing with the causes of the particular problems. And this project that carry this idea about genius, creative person or scientist who 
are the only one possessing the necessary knowledge and wisdom and who is going to save of course via innovation and technology the planet from self-destruction such colossal and mythic project use the same rhetoric and ideology of the past centuries as well terms like conquest colonization and so on this phenomenon of western melancholy can be or could be also observed in the mainstream Hollywood production. For example, this is a blockbuster Geostorm uh, from 2018, where a network of satellites around the planet, again, a new technology, controls the climate change. And Geostorm is just one of the many movies dealing with the climate change produced at the mainstream level during the last decade. I'm going to show lots of uh, project from the pop uh, uh, culture because for us in the speculative design it's important to see, or of course in design it's important to see and look in the pop culture because design is it's 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 a place where design operates and in 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 this like uh, uh, in this like uh, uh, movies they dealing with with the climate change or 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 nature catastrophes uh, we have always this human mythical hero, scientist, who saves the planet. Of course, it's always like a white man. And uh, it is something which is uh, one of the, I would say, most important science fiction writer, Ursula Le Guin. Uh, she is criticizing this uh, idea using the term techno heroism. And this imaginary of the future we see around, it's not so unexpected. If you look into today's education, which is based on the hyper techno optimism. And this worldview is rooted in the number of dogmas. For example, that human evolved from the observer into creator. And then in the name of the progress and growth, he can change the environment. And of course, the consequences of human activity is going to be resolved by means of science and technology anyway. And we can understand this Western melancholy, this loop when we produce new technology to solve the problems which was caused by the previous technology as a kind of ultimate consequences of accepting our incapacity to stop devastation of the environment. But however, as a reaction, designers started to practice different approaches to design, moving from the dominant perception and conventional design practices to rethinking the role of technology in our, our everyday lives, focusing on the not applications of the technology, but implications of the technology. And speculating, speculating about new technological as way as well, of course, social, economic, and economical and political futures. And it's important to think how new technologies will change our life when it comes to our homes. So to think about what kind of implications some of the new and novel and uh, and and uh, emerging technology will have in the near future. Uh, in our lives. And speculative design practice is one of the most significant examples of such new design practices. Expanding the critical practice to our imagination and diverse vision of the possible future scenarios. And it is roots in the so-called English critical design, which uh, which was uh, uh, developed or which emerged in the in, in the UK in, in in the Royal College of Art in London uh, in the late 90s and later more developed in in the 2000 in the first and second decade of, of 2000 and with the work uh, from Anthony Dunn and Fiona Rebi and here we, we see kind of a manifesto of this new critical thinking or critical approach to design where we can see the difference between traditional design practice and and the critical design practice which later became speculative design practice uh, basically starting with this 
main idea about like uh, uh, going from problem solving in design to problem finding, uh, uh, going from provide answers to ask questions. But if you go even even back in the in uh, even like more in the past. Uh, one of the main uh, references Italian radical practice, which confronted the, from the 70s and uh, 60s and 70s uh, from the last century, which confronted high modernism at that time, which was like dominant ideology uh, by focusing on the social issues and rethinking the profession. And speculative practice is dealing with the notion what is preferable future and for whom is preferable. And this is one of the key tools, uh, uh, speculative of people thinking about future, doing forecasting, uh, prediction, or uh, speculating about future using. It's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's called the future cone. And here we can see that the future is not linear. The future is like, uh, uh, there is a, there is a many possible futures. So starting with this, Present, we go in the future, which is like uh, uh, there is lots of possibilities for the future, and we can see these uh, different circles, which are possible, plausible, and uh, and and preferable future. So, uh, kind of role of the speculative designers to think or to uh, come in with a different scenario dealing with this like possible future. So, for us, it's interesting. Uh, what is the preferable future and for who is preferable for us, like a citizens or normal people or for corporation, for industry, for government, or, uh, or better to say who owns the future. And this practice is related to the series of similar practices. There is lots of overlapping between different practices, uh, critical design, design fiction, uh, radical design, discursive design, traditional design, and and so on and so on. And it's a kind of not really like a hard discipline or really like a close and defined discipline. It's more like approach. So it could be primarily be seen as a kind of attitude or position rather than traditionally defined methodology. Uh, however, we can still point some of the distinctive characteristics of this approach and determine a basic framework. Uh, since speculative design continuously interact with other related practices, fields, and disciplines, and use, uh, uses any methods and tools and approaches that are accessible and appropriate at a given moment, from our experience, we see it's a really great coherent uh, uh, approach to the uh, different multidisciplinary disciplinary group dealing with the future. So in, in, in speculative design practices, we, we always collaborate with the different uh, uh, experts from the different fields, from IT to uh, to solo sociology, psychology, any kind of science which is uh, related to the topics we are addressing in our projects. And going back to the present, in, in last few years, speculative design became very much in fashion. I, I would say like in, in last uh, maybe five or six years. And we can see that more and more designers embraced speculative and related design approaches in their everyday practice. Uh, more and more studios were producing visions of the future technological scenarios. And more and more companies were employing designers to imagine future trends. There are more and more mainstream. When I say mainstream, I, I, I mean like exhibitions uh, and conferences uh, uh, which are focused not on only on the experts from the field of design and related uh, disciplines, but also to the to the really broad public, uh, which are dedicated to the future and related to the speculative design. And of course, we are witnessing an increasing number of educational programs based on the speculative practice as a kind of tool for changing the future. And for potential students, they were high places for studying. But however, uh, in, in this last year's speculative design were confronted with the strong criticism. I would summarize this criticism 
and it's mostly uh, that is separated from the real world, that is coming from the privileged Western perspective, and that looks the salvation in the dystopian scenarios. And science fiction has always been a great inspiration within the design practice, with the long history of creating imaginary scenarios, worlds, and the characters. And especially from, uh, for the design practice, which is dealing with the future as, as it in a speculative practice. However, these visions of future also serve as a tool in the hands of the big corporation, in the hands of the big corporation, in realization of their preferable future, which are usually built around corporate corporation technologies. And this is one of the best known examples. It's from 1939, New York World Exhibition and a General Motors a pavilion called Futurama. Increased speed. And it was designed one of the by one of the pioneers of the American industrial design, Normal Here Bell Gates, and which was representing the vision of the America city in the future, 30 years in the future. Uh, this was the vision of America city from the 1960s. And unfortunately, we see that this kind of future later was realized. And uh, this kind of future was not designed to suit humans, but cars and highways, which was, of course, the main product of this corporation, General Motors. And this kind of corporative fetishization of the technology uh, dictate the role of technology society. This is another warfare, uh, 1964 IBM, and the presentation of uh, uh, this, this, this pavilion designed by the by uh, was focused on the artificial intelligence, which was technology devel developed in the Cold War, war during the time. And uh, in, this, in, in, in this situation, was this, at this war, war fair, was seeking for its new market position, its new life. And this similar rhetoric is nowadays used by the big corporation, mostly in the IT world. Keywords such as safety, optimization, efficiency, speed, and similar are used in all corporate visions of the future, which are built around their new technologies. And this is one example from Microsoft. And those visions of the future are, are entirely uh, dehumanized. And, and as one of my colleagues always like to say, it's uh, where we have this, in, in these visions of the future, People are props of the technology, props for the technology. So we are the props. But luckily, future scenarios presented in the film and TV production include criticism and offers much more fun. This is from Cal TV series, The Twilight Zone, uh, which was at the peak during the 60s and 70s uh, in the last century, which stands as one of the most significant examples of the speculations about possible future. And in last few years, we are witnessing a growing production of dystopian stories in the mainstream Western context. And it was apparent that dystopians were back in fashion. This is a black mirror, which is probably, it, it was like one of the most popular uh, uh, fiction dealing with the uh, uh, with the future and technology. And dystopian literature was also on the rise, recently reached the levels of its golden era, which was called wartime. But of course, there is no doubt about this historical import importance of dystopian fictions, which uh, kind of serving as defense mechanism and assistance in recognizing the dark wars in the future or, or of the future. But we should not forget that already we already really live in such scenarios. This is a Neuralink, uh, uh, this, this idea from, uh, from Elon Musk or Metaverse, uh, where Black Mirror references are obvious. But also, if you look especially at the Global South, people live in such scenario for many years, and we don't have to uh, uh, look very, very far away, but uh, for people living in uh, on 
on the edges of so-called developed worlds, we have they are also witnessing this kind of scenario for the for the many years. And this popularity of dystopian future scenarios also implied a certain dangers that it could let people lets people understand catastrophic scenarios as unavoidable, which makes them passive instead of proactive. So we can say like uh, there is no future, there is no anything to do. So we became like passive in thinking or changing our the future. And this domination of dystopia scenarios of the future have direct impact on the present, creating kind of temporal loop, which stopping any possible radical improvement. And such Netflixization of the future as a result of this dystopia media production created the future that is linear and, and predictable. And therefore, for us, it's important to start thinking again, again about this like different, non-linear, non-centralized future. And dystopian thinking requires some counterbalance, positive visions of the future. And this was all before pandemic and before the war in Ukraine. And in this context from the first decade of the 2000s, we started building our approach here in Split. And the approach we named Mediterranean speculative approach, practiced far away from the European and urban and technological centers on something which we call the ages of the Europe. And our focus or focus of our speculative practice is on implication of global topics in the local context or how emerging technological, economic, social, and political changes will impact the context of Mediterranean Southeast of Europe. And this approach resulted in a series of workshop titled Mediterranean Speculative Triology. And I will show you some of the projects just to as a case studies. And we start with our classical speculative design project from 2014. And the theme of this project was a smart city in the context of one big European research project, we were part of it. And this is a kind of fictional near future story based on the Mediterranean tradition of the city states. And our city, our fictional, city, future city, Eutropia, called Eutropia, Eutropia. Uh, it's a city which economical and political status are based on the trade of the cities in private information. So this kind of new information-based economy gives independence and welfare to all citizens. And this scenario question is what about privacy, this welfare city? Is this kind of basic human needs or we just trade our privacy for the for the welfare. And of course, city developed the state of the art infrastructure for collecting the data and citizen cooperate to assure a constant flow of information. I will show you just like a, a, a few minutes uh, of the video presentation of this project.
Uh, okay, uh, the, the second project I'm showing today, it's a project for 2017, which was focused on the automa automation of the work and labor in the local context. And here we are dealing with automation of the cruising sailboats. So we, has, we were speculating how it will change the related occupation. So we went to the uh, Split City Harbor, Split Harbor Master Office, and we collected data about number of the skippers which were growing exponential, exponentially on the Adriatic coast, and which is becoming one of the most popular occupations. And this project brings the near future story about the last skipper, which was once romantic and one of the most popular occupation, but in the, our future, fictional future, became to extinction by the, by the automated sailboat systems. I will show just a teaser of, of this work. Bude interesantno, ljudi. Mislim, to je kao posao interesantno. E, umislio, ti putuješ Ali... po svitu i upoznaš ljudi, ljudi dolaze se upoznava s tebom i još dobiješ neku. Ja. <laughs> I to je vrlo interesantno. E? Ovo zadnje. E? <laughs> pa već danas postoji intencija da posada na pogotovo velikim trgovačkim brodovima zapravo samo rad gleda rad elektronike. Praktički elektronika upravlja brodom veći dio plovidbe od isplovljavanja do uplovljavanja u luku. Osnovno moje mišljenje je da skipera ne može niko zamijeniti. Nijedan stroj, nijedan ne znam, tehničko dostignuće. Neko to uvijek mora biti presutan. Pa za očekivati da bi eventualni ljudi na brodu samo e, mogli uživati u plovidbi dok bi cijeli posao za njih objavila elektronika. Ne, meni to, ne, to nije to. Ne. Ja mislim da to nije to. Ne, toliko daleko ne možemo razmišljati. Mislim, skiper, kad skiper, vjerojatno neće umoriti. On će mora biti na brodu. On će mora biti, šta ja znam, na letilici. Danas, sutra, šta ja znam, pristo. Neko će mora s tim. Ljudski faktor ne, neće biti isključen. U nijekom slučaju. Računalo se ne umara, računalo u proračunu ne griješi i računalo uvijek igra na sigurno. Čovjek je sklon i umaranju, ali čovjek je sklon i riskiranju, što računalo nikad neće biti. E, kada bi računalo bilo dovoljno sigurno da se u nijednom trenutku neće dakle, doći do nekog poremećaja u radu računala, onda bi vjerojatno bilo sigurnije od ljudske posade i zaočekivati je da na neke duge pruge da će računalo moći sigurnije upravljati e, brodon od čovjeka. A mislim, osim toga, skiper, uz to što je skiper, ako ima malo afiniteta za neke druge stvari, kada je s gostima tipa skoči tu more, izvaditi hobotnicu i takve neke stvari... Viš, kuvake. To je već to, niti jedan stroj neće moći napraviti. se i to ma proda automatizirala se i filomena a šta ti fali ovako bolje ti je smjeno nije ti dosadno a ja ne dam ja tebe nikome a ko zna je radi ova kamera Mi će me kapetanija gleda, evo ako me gleda, evo da vidimo da radi, evo izgleda da radi, izradi. Evo moramo voditi dnevnik, pratiti sve živo i zapisivati u dnevnik, jel to radi kapetanije moramo sve, jer me oni gledaju, moramo to paziti, sve da bude tip top. E, di su sad svi oni moji skiperi? Stoje u kancelarijama, uredima, glume menadžere, bukiraju, ukrcavaju putnike, gledaju im sigurnost, a, a makinje na voze brode. T 
htjeli su snimi moj glas, ali nisam ja tija. Stroj može imat sva znanja, ali nema dušu kaj i ja. Ok. Uh, this project was shown at uh, Vienna Biennale as a part of an exhibition with the name How We Will Work. And we present it as a kind of anthropological archive with this like fictional, this documentary, the fictional video, which presenting this uh, uh, last Mediterranean skipper and with the documentaries and the artifacts from the past, from the past as a, uh, as a kind of model of the sailing boat uh, how uh, it uh, looked like before the automatization and with uh, uh, this uh, photographs, uh, uh, photos from the skippers from the area like personal archive. And uh, for us was important because uh, uh, this time in this project, we had different st stakeholders included in our design, design process from the expert to the skippers. And this project raised intensive discussion, both with the public and the experts. And then we're going to do our uh, next project from 2018, which was focused on the climate changes on, changes on the Adriatic Sea, because the Adriatic Sea in the last few years achieved the highest sea temperature and the highest air temperature ever. So for us, it was a kind of uh, important topics to think about, to try to research uh, uh, more uh, in the speculative context. And this project intended to provide the possible alternative scenarios to expected climate, extreme climate futures, and uh, uh, to offer a kind of alternative scenarios, or better to, to say, to prepare us, to prepare us for the possible post-apocalyptic Mediterranean. But also within this project, we also wanted to offer a concrete tools, methods and techniques, tools, techniques and mechanisms to help individuals and community in rebuilding their lives after disaster, providing kind of new hopes in the new beginnings. And so we situated our story in 2055, second half of the 21st century, when global climate changes resulted in the extreme changes of life and economic conditions in the eastern part of the Adriatic Sea. And our city, the split, uh, used to be uh, uh, in the last century, a very important industrial center, mostly known for its large shipyard, uh, but due, through the transition time, in the in the in the end of last century, uh, it uh, uh, and the first quarter quarter of this century became a city with economically with with economically economy entirely relied on tourism. And in our scenario, uh, in two thousand fifty five, slowly with disaster, tourism is the one of the most in, uh, important economic sector disappear completely and migration has started the collapse of the tourism and the number of citizens fled towards the inland and the northern part of the Europe. Those who stayed tried to use sea level rising and the penetration of the sea water inside the historical city core as a kind as a kind of op opportunity for the future as a kind of new hope and Historical city centers are becoming places for new forms of the food production. And in this scenario, the Central Asian Square in Split becomes one of the city, becomes one of the city pools for the new mariculture. And for these extremely resistant sea organisms, unicellular algae, branch shrimps, and sea anemones. And these surrounding buildings I use for production, drying, preserving, packaging, and preparation for distribution. And citizens are organized in small cooperatives. So uh, in, during this project, we started this investigation in the local context in collaboration with the experts, with the scientists from the Institute of Sea Studies and Fisheries, and we work together on these background scenarios. Carried this research, 
together to find resistant organisms, as I mentioned before, uh, algae, shrimps, and anemones, and to work on this uh, installation, uh, which forms a kind of uh, food chain or a cycle. And uh, during one month in the Institute, we cultivated algae by using mineral cell light, which served as food for the branch shrimps, which we use as a food for the sea anemones. So we wanted with this case study, provide concrete tools and methods or recipe, how to, uh, how, uh, to build a possible marine uh, agri aquaculture for the future. And after one month, uh, we achieved growth of all the species and we transfer all in the gallery space. And we called the chiefs from the local cooks association as a partners and they prepared and demonstrated a new food potential uh, as a, one of the, uh, uh, from this mariculture of new future. So they basically could cooked at the exhibition, a big sea anemone risotto for the, uh, for the public who came at the exhibition. Also during the exhibition, uh, with the expert from the institutes, we organized educational workshop for the students and high school pupils about practical aspects of cultivation of marine organism for food and other production. And uh, we also had a workshop with the small kids about life after disaster in our city, and they kind of designed different ideas how the future would uh, is, is going to look like in our city uh, after this like climate changes uh, uh, results like sea level rising and the temperature of sea rising. And after one month of growing the gallery, we achieved uh, we we returned these anemones back to the sea, and. Uh, we also publish a do-it-yourself do guide for building mariculture as a print and online. This is a kind of, uh, 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 for us, was an important outcome of this project. So everyone could uh, replicate uh, in the future uh, this kind of, this installation we, we designed here. And our focus was always uh, how to transfer this project or our project into education. So from 2004, we are running a series of multidisciplinary international workshops dealing with the contemporary design practices. And always trying to act within the, the local context. And in that, in that context, we started discussion, primary focusing, focusing on our activities on the educational context. So, in order to critically reflect educational practices in this area. Uh, since a lot of mainstream design and design education, it's still stuck in this last century modernistic notion of design. And my, my colleague, uh, Jem Soger, uh, wrote this uh, three common design means the design good, design improves people's lives and design solves uh, uh, people's problems, which is uh, of course true, but it's of course, Many times it's really, really untrue. And for us in education, this task, task is quite hard. So we want to move students from the problem solving and market perspective to bring them critical tools and methods, and then to generate new concrete social actions in the real world. And in 2018, we started the European project called Speculative Edu, with this intention to look into the uh, speculative and related uh, design practices. And we have six partners uh, during this two and a half years of the project. And uh, we, in this, like during the project, we mapped speculative design landscape in order to bring overview of the contemporary speculative practice. And we conducted more than 15 interviews with a number of practitioners and educators uh, with addition open call for case studies. So we presented interesting case study at our website. And we hosted a uh, few educational activities. This was interesting. It was a summer school in Rome in 2019 with the topic in, in neo-rural futures. Everyone was talking about like urban future and, uh, but we were talking about what is gonna be with this uh, rural uh, uh, areas in the future. 
And through all these activities, we have opened a series of new questions, uh, mostly dealing what is, what is going to be the future of our practice. And what now? What now that we are already living in way, what may look like dystopian futures, when this life after disaster is becoming slowly life with the disaster, where, where speculation became reality, where there is no anymore this techno heroic future, which Ursula, Ursula Le Guin was, uh, was criticizing. And when speculative and future oriented design practices now becoming even more and more mainstream, when speculations basically become becoming a reality. And we see that some of these old narratives are back. The technology will be crucial in our survival in the future. And which is kind of danger which is coming back and again. And all of this opens a new series of questions for the speculative design practice or for the design practice in general. So at the first look, the most visible legacy of the speculative design practice is a number of projects dealing with the dystopian future. Uh, this is the one from the 2007 dealing uh, uh, with uh, birth flu in Asia. And this project, including different kinds of disasters, disasters, wars, climate disaster, totalitarian state, technological dystopian, et cetera, et cetera, uh, already exists. So we can find the uh, uh, most of the of, of the disaster happening today. We can find in the previous speculative projects. And now we hear arguments like uh, we have told you, you didn't prepare, you haven't done anything to avoid this, uh, and this has been used in uh, one part of the speculative community. But it's we have to be very critical since those views leading in despair, and the state when practice or practice when dystopian became normality. So we, we should look more from the positive side when we see a number of great, efficient, alternative, bottom-up methods to deal with pandemic. Often coming from the margins, uh, we, can, we can talk about economical and geographical margins, uh, practices like uh, permaculture, makers community, community media, and, and so on and so on. So it's a kind of, a project, it would be interesting and we are interesting to, to look, uh, uh, look now. And uh, this is an example from Croatia. Uh, unfortunately, we had like a, uh, a big earthquake in 2021 when uh, we saw that bottom-up self-organized community actions uh, were faster and better provided, faster and better result than government top-down systemic mechanism for dealing with disasters. So during the project and, and during the final phase of the project of the speculative edu project and during the final phase was of uh, the, the, the kind of uh, 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 this mature phase of pandemia, we were interested in, uh, in uh, what we have learned in this almost like 20 years of the practice and how to use it now and how to use it in the future. To, to repeat, speculative design appeared as a result of this satisfaction with the state of design and design education for many years. And we hope that has created a small, small foundation for design to move forward, of course, via education, and that it could offer some insights to help to address for us, this is the most important question, how we can educate students for decade to come. And to contribute to this discussion, um, we published the book, which is including our overview of the practice. We reflection on the past, we choose a historical references, with the present, we selected case studies with employed approaches, tools and methods, and the future part with a critical view of the speculative practice. And this is the book. Uh, and at the end of the book, we have summarized a few challenges to aim uh, to improve the ways 
uh, in which we teach, perform, and evaluate, evaluate speculative design projects. I will summarize some of this. Oh, we, 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 uh, we were talking about this kind of challenges the deal and we, we talk about. So if you're going to reclaim the future, we need to start from the present, that we have to focus on the real world and remove ourselves from the glamorous dystopian worlds, that design is about both means and ends, that we should not forget the design is always, the design always has its consequences. That we should start with the action now and here, and that we could learn from the margins in the periphery. And the design is practice is always in collaboration, and the design and practice is primarily local. With the this may be kind of key. Uh, uh, challenge or maybe key uh, uh, observation that speculation is our duty not to privilege. And um, you can still buy uh, the book via our distribution, but it is free for educational institutions. So if you visit Speculative Edu EU website, you can uh, order the free book uh, uh, if you are working at any educational institutions. And for the for this like uh, end of this uh, presentation, so what now? What we are doing now, uh, and uh, as a kind of uh, reflection on the past here for dealing with this past, present, the future of practice, uh, doesn't matter how we we call it. We uh, we we started to move from this life after disaster to the here and now, and uh, to think what we what can be done prior to potential disaster in the near future. So in our last project with mapped, uh, we again returned to the local context and we mapped out the various autonomous communities, collectives and organization active in the city and the surrounding areas, which shows shown like a certain level of resilience and for to the possible future disasters. And we map these preferable futures of the, for example, permaculture community, amateur radio teams, community media producers, and many, many others, many others. And we also feature this local community of resilience and activities uh, in the gallery, but also we organize a number of public workshops aimed to the wide, wide audience in order to re 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 revitalize a certain skills that can be almost entirely forgotten. Skills that we see as relevant in the fostering resilience and activities. For example, we organize, organize workshops relating to the amateur radio broadcasting, natural fruit preservation methods, bake repair shops, uh, uh, reuse of obsolete electrical equipment, shock architecture and its potential in regarding to the crisis, even the importance of so-called parrot care with respect to marginalized communities. And what we saw during this project that these systems, which is presented here, uh, which is repeatedly perturbed and shaped by very various disasters, but still re yet remains fairly homogeneous and resistant. Also, uh, resistant to all these kinds of changes they are starting from the bottom-up communities, or with the disaster which is coming from the uh, from the top down, and our future work we see as a kind of continuation of our activities on the local level of periphery, from bottom up, with local people in collaboration and participation, but with this hope and aim to establish more connection with the similarly minded movements and projects on national, regional, and global levels. Uh, you can find more info on our social networks, or just you can uh, visit the uh, Speculative Edu EU website, or you can just uh, uh, ask me uh, some questions now, or you can ask me anything you you want, which is related to the speculative practice via my uh, email uh, contact. Uh, so thank you. Uh, this time was a little bit shorter, so I'm going to leave some few minutes if you have any. Uh, questions, comments regarding this uh, presentation.
Thank you very much, Professor, for well, for both your comprehensive presentation and also your uh, your concision in the explanation of the of the very terms that have been uh, uh, included in in your presentation. Uh, now, if any of of, of the participants uh, would like to make any questions, just feel free to open your your microphones and uh, and ask your your questions. Thank you. It seems them that uh, the presentation was quite straightforward, and there are no uh, there are no questions. So it is my turn then to say once again thank you, Professor, for being here with us today for your presentation, and thank you to to all the all the participants on on this session. It has been a pleasure to have once again. Uh, a webinar of the spin-off competence lab. Uh, the recording of these, uh, well, apart from the live streaming, the recording of this uh, of this session will be made uh, public on on the YouTube channel of the of the CU Alliance. And if you, if any of you want any any additional information about the next, the upcoming webinars of the spin-off competence lab uh, this information is available on the website of the of the research project with any additional comments uh, thank you again uh, stay tuned for the next uh, sessions and events of of research you and see you very soon thank you thank very you. much bye